Sure, thanks, Mark. And uh, this is actually the third time I've been here in the past year. Um, uh, twice in the run-up to Copenhagen and now uh, with the aftermath. And uh, I guess, Mark, um, I just wanted to, to start by saying buck up. Um, I think there, there's, there's a lot more to the Copenhagen Accord than meets the eye. And, and you know, having spent roughly 18 years working on climate change, I'm encouraged. Uh, uh, I think there's a lot in this agreement and a lot of progress was made. And so I'm encouraged. Uh, Having said that, it was a difficult two weeks, a very difficult two weeks. In fact, a difficult two years from the time between the Bali Action Plan and, and Copenhagen, and, and a slow two years. You can almost think about these negotiations as a long marathon with a very, very short sprint at the end, producing a, an entirely different outcome than I think people wanted, and, and, a, and a partial outcome, but a quite an important outcome. And, and there's still quite a bit of work to do. but. I think that work can now be done, given that we have this agreement. Um, and, and, it, and you know, I, I view it as a major step in tackling climate change. Um, I think it's important to note that the accord itself is a representative document. Um, over 180 countries were prepared to agree to it. Um, it was negotiated line by line by 28 countries representing um, all the major regional groups and the major emitting countries, not just the United States and the EU, but China, Brazil, India, Russia, and then countries that are um, going to be deeply affected by climate change, countries like Bangladesh, the Maldives, Grenada, Gabon. Uh, these countries were all in the room negotiating that final, uh, the, the, the text of, of the Copenhagen Accord. And it addresses some fundamental issues that we could not get agreement on at a lower level. And in fact, over the two years, we ended up basically repeating ourselves over and over again on a number of key issues. Long-term goal, transparency, levels of commitments, um, the types of commitments, and, and finance. And all of these things are spelled out in the, uh, in the Copenhagen Accord. And so from that perspective, it's actually quite an important document. And with the fact that there were 120 world leaders at this meeting, and that the agreement itself was negotiated at the highest levels of government. Um, I think there's now been enough breakthroughs that we can go back and work through some of the issues that we, were troubling us before. Now, what is the Copenhagen Accord? It's, it's basically a 12-paragraph document, um, and so quite a simple document. And in fact, the first two paragraphs basically talk about the same thing. <laughs> so, uh, but, but an important issue the, the, the issue of what's dangerous. Uh, and the consensus is that, that, that within this document, it calls for um, two degrees centigrade or Celsius is defining dangerous and defining um, action to hold the increase in global temperature below two degrees. Um, there was some discussion, especially by um, some of the island states, the Iosis countries, to push for a 1.5 degree goal, but in the end, um, consistent with what the IPCC is saying, a two-degree goal is in the document. There's a paragraph at the end that talks about it, analyzing and reviewing that, that, that goal. Uh, paragraph three um, deals up front. Um, I interestingly, there are a couple of issues that are embedded in this adaptation document. It will be interesting to see moving forward how these issues relate. It's not just adaptation to climate change itself, but also um, include is includes references to the um, potential effects of response measures. This is the issue that's been raised by the OPEC countries. Um, as countries reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, reduce potentially their use of energy, how is that going to affect economies? That separate issue has been embedded in this paragraph, and it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as we move forward. Then you get to paragraphs four and five, and that's really where the mitigation commitments and actions are are discussed, and they're different. It, it, it reflects this um, concept of common but differentiated uh, uh, um, commitments and respective capabilities within, within, within paragraphs four and five. The Annex I countries are committing to essentially a target and a time. So um, to reduce emissions by 2020 from a, a base year that will be documented. 
Um, it also contains the provisions that will require measurement, monitoring, and verification of mit mitigation commitments and financing. Paragraph 5 deals with um, developing country, non-Annex 1 uh, mitigation actions, uh, or NAMAs. And an initial list of those NAMAs will be um, submitted by countries that will be party to this agreement. Um, and what's interesting here is, is there's also language about review. And it's couched in two ways. Countries that are going to take actions unilaterally or on their own will undergo a process of analysis and consultations. Um, and now the question is, what does that mean? Well, that, that actually is pretty well describes what's currently going on for Annex I countries under the Framework Convention. Um, each year, we submit a national inventory to the UN. Every four years, we submit a national communication. That is our national plan. And a team from the UN that's made up of representatives from the Secretariat, but also um, technical experts from countries, comes to the United States and looks at our data. They look at our report. They look at the underlying data that went into the report. They look at publicly available information on our energy use, on our forests, um, on our transportation systems. And they write a report. And they say, well, the US followed the guidelines for how we submitted our report. The report seems to hold up based on in independent information. Oh, and by the way, we have questions about this number and that number. And we have questions about what this policy will really do and you know, how you've described this, this level of support. And then we'll have an we have an opportunity to respond. And in the end, there's a report that gets submitted to the parties that is the, the review of the US national communication. It's a consultative process, and it's a review process. And that's, in essence, where I see this process going for, for non-Annex I countries. Uh, review and consultation is really you know, essentially what we're doing right now for developed countries, although the rules and guidelines for how that will be undertaken are yet to be written. Um, and then, the, then, then there's a separate provision within paragraph 5 dealing with countries that are receiving support or assistance in meeting their actions. And there, the process will be more formal international measurement reporting and verification. Um, paragraph 6 um, talks about a, the establishment of a, a financial support um, to deal with uh, forest uh, deforestation. The, the red issue is, is characterized in Para 6. Um, Para 7 talks about the importance of pursuing market-based approaches. Um, and then Para 8 is where finance is, developed, is addressed in, in detail. And in fact, it picks up on the statements that were made in the run-up to the, those last couple of days with a 10% a or a $10 billion um, fund to be created between 2010 and 2012 and a, and a, and a goal of, of getting up $100 billion in annual funding from both public and private sources by 2020. Um, the, the paragraphs 9 through 11 or, or, uh, really deal with the mechanisms to create finance, not, not the exclusive mechanisms, but mechanisms to deal with finance and tech transfer and the creation of a Copenhagen Green Climate Fund. And then finally, Para 12 again comes back to this goal, the ultimate objective, what defines dangerous, and, um, and basically lays out steps to review that, the adequacy of, of the two, per, two degree warming goal. Now, stepping back, well, what does this all mean? Well, it's important to, to um, say that this agreement actually is not a COP decision. If you look at the, there is a COP decision on the Copenhagen Accord, but the COP decision is to note that this document exists. It, it, it's simply that. And so there is a question as to what the standing and what the status of this document is. And in fact, we could not get this document agreed um, during the last day when, when, in fact, I was a spectator, just I guess the same as Jerry and others. Uh, you know, watching this um, unfold at the highest levels. Um, there was an attempt to, to codify this uh, accord as a COP decision, and, and that could not be agreed. The, the process within the UN, within the UN Framework Convention, is, is one of consensus. And consensus is defined as uh, the lack of, of a voiced uh, objection. 
And in fact, it's very hard to achieve consensus when you have all the delegates from one country waving their hand and waving their flag, you know, and, and yelling that, that you know, this should not go through. And in fact, there were five countries that, in the end, blocked consensus. Um, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Bolivia, and, and Tuvalu. And, and Tuvalu for slightly different reasons. I think Tuvalu is very concerned about this 1.5 degree warming. Um, but the, the Latin countries in particular were, and these fought four in particular, were concerned about a, a number of other things, probably, although it's hard to d describe why, but, but, but probably having very little to do with climate change directly. Um, and in the end, we did not res achieve consensus. And so there is some question as to exactly how we will move forward. Um, the Secretariat is taking initial steps to move forward. Nonetheless, they, they um, posted a document over the weekend um, uh, guiding countries on how to move forward with these deadlines that are at the end of the month, basically saying that they will serve as a repository for this information. My guess is they're going to be posting the information when it's submitted on the, on the web. The U.S. does plan to submit our, our commitment at the end of the month, consistent with what the President described in Copenhagen, a 17 percent reduction economy-wide um, from 2005 levels in 2020. Um, but, you know, there are going to be some big questions as to how we do move forward um, and how the ongoing work under the Kyoto Protocol fits in. Obviously, the Kyoto countries, um, the, the, the descriptions in Para 4 can closely parallel what's in the Kyoto Protocol. And for the United States, there's going to be the ability to have some flexibility in how we describe our commitments, but it essentially will be a target and a timetable. Um, there are going to be questions moving forward um, in terms of consistency with our national system. And when we're looking at issues like agriculture, there's lots of questions as to how agriculture will fit in to a post-Kyoto or, a, or a, a second commitment period within Kyoto. Um, does it fit under the CDM? Is there a new mechanism? I think there's also going to be questions within the U.S. system as to how international agriculture fits into overall international emissions offsets. Um, but I think, you know, just some general observations. There's really, at this point, no turning back. Um, I think one of the things that the Copenhagen Accord does is it, it, it fully defines, I think for the first time, this concept that is Kind of, it's stated in the, in the framework convention back in, in 1992, this, this statement of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Um, you know, up to now, that has been the developed countries are going to act first and the developed country, developing countries will act second. I think at this point, it means there are going to be, everyone is going to take a step, but we'll take different steps based on our differentiated responsibilities and our respective capabilities. And so that's quite important. Um, I think this question of how we move forward under the UN Framework Convention is going to need to be resolved and, and fairly soon. Um, and I think, um, you know, given the objections of some countries. Um, and I think within the U.S., um, I think in terms of what we need to move forward to domestically, I think having serious commitments and actions put on the table by China, by India, by Brazil. Having Brazil step up and say, we're not interested in getting finance to do this stuff. In fact, we want to be a donor country. Really redefining the relationship between developed and developing countries within the Framework Convention. So a lot of very um, important outcomes, a lot of positive movement at this meeting, and a lot of work left to do. Um, how am I doing on time? Two more minutes. All right. The final thing I just wanted to mention, and I think Jerry raised that um, we announced this global research alliance on agricultural greenhouse gases, and I wanted to take a minute to describe what it is and where we are. Um, again, another important substantive step that, that occurred during the, the meeting, independent of the UN, but important. Um, right now, we've got 23 countries that have signed up to join this alliance. Um, the focus is going to be on agricultural greenhouse gas mitigation research, um, and the focus is going to be on developing mitigation practices and technologies, 
um, reducing measurement uncertainties, sharing information and data, the development of common research protocols, and then linking researchers in a network that's effective. We're planning to have the first meeting, I think we were saying March, but it looks like it may be in early April in New Zealand. And the work moving forward is going to be initially to develop a charter that's going to define how this um, coalition will work, um, identifying working groups, getting our work plans together, and getting substantive work going on the ground. Um, the U.S. and USDA in particular um, is going to strengthen our, our research portfolio on agricultural um, greenhouse gas mitigation research, um, up from a, what we were spending, which was about $10 million a year, up to a a $90 million over the next four years, as part of a larger increase within USDA on, on climate change research, up to um, about $320 million over the next four years we, we intend to um, spend. In addition, um, we're hoping to engage developing countries uh, through the Borlaug Fellowship Program, bringing them to the U.S., having them co-located on our research sites, and, and training them on our research protocols and methods, and, and giving them the opportunity to participate in this global alliance. <laughs>